What happens when your worst fear becomes your reality? Hi, I'm Brent Cassidy. Welcome to the Nightmare Success In and Out podcast, where we explore how to overcome your fears and nightmares and set yourself free. We're going to be exploring this topic with guys that was in Leavenworth with and others who survived their own nightmare. These stories can be inspiring, sometimes sad. There's some humor, but hopefully you can come away with a nugget of something that'll help you knock down some of the prisons you built up in your own mind. We're back, Nightmare Success listeners. Welcome aboard. This is where you come for uh, what happens when your worst fear becomes your reality. How do you adapt, survive, overcome, set yourself free? Well, I have a great guest today. Funny thing is, is that Jessica and I, it's Jessica Henry, um, we went through this about a week ago, and I was listening back, and I thought, it's such a good interview, but the internet connection wasn't good. So I, I called Jessica back. I said, you know what? That was just kind of a run-through for us. We're going to try this again. So Jessica was nice enough to come back today, and you'll enjoy her. Uh, you'll really enjoy her story because it's a great, unbelievable story. I wanted to start off here because I found something I just thought was a great quote. She was interviewed, and this uh, article that I was reading, but it said, everything I'm doing is something I love. Henry said, I had been through so many things in my life, juvenile delinquency, foster care, teen pregnancy, addiction, rehab, therapy, prison, jail, probation, parole. And I'm like, oh, why did I go through all this? And now I know why it's because I can help those who are struggling on going through similar things to make changes one step at a time. Such a great, great quote because she's been through so much. Right now, Jessica Henry is uh, a manager at Nation Outside. I want to give a shout out to Tony Gant who helped us connect on this. Uh, Tony was a great guest on the show. He's doing incredible things himself uh, in the Michigan area, all with reentry and policy and those type of things, which also Jessica's doing. Uh, but she's... Um, I was just reading from here, after having been incarcerated for nine years, she is a mentor who uses her personal experience to help others through recovery. She provides the support citizens need to teach and reach the milestones in their own lives. Uh, Jessica, big time believer in education uh, and, and the power of education, and she's big, big uh, proponent of uh, access to housing. She just graduated last spring from Spring Arbor University, earning her bachelor's in uh, social work, focusing on correction counseling, and she got a double minor in psychology and business. And uh, she, I, the other thing I want to point out is she got three associate degrees from Jackson College while she was in, in with honors, high honors, while she was incarcerated. So I just think that's inspiring. It's just, it's just good stuff. And uh, Jessica's got a heck of a story. I want to unpack all that, jump into all that. Before, before we do that, I want to recognize our sponsor, Auto Plaza Direct. You know, who likes going, spending a couple of weekends walking the car lots, looking for a car? We've all done it. Then you spend like four or five hours in the dealership to buy the car. You know, it's kind of like a trip to the dentist. Well, there's a better way to take away all that pain and hassle of getting a car. It's called Auto Plaza Direct. They're your personal car concierge. Do you just tell them the car you want? what you can pay, and they'll go find that car for you. They'll negotiate your best price and deliver that car to you. They also offer you warranties and financing. It's all full service. Go to autoplazadirect.com to get started with your personal car concierge. The new hassle-free way, the car buying experience you deserve, Auto Plaza Direct. Tell them that Brent from Nightmare Success sent you. Welcome in, Jessica Henry. How are you? I'm good, Brent. I think I'm about to take on that auto plaza deal. It sounds real nice. <laughs> it sounds like the easy way, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. and I, I've done the I've done the process, and and uh, you know, I, in fact, on my deal, I was getting a truck, and I, I was like, oh, I just don't think this deal's going to happen. But they they stepped in and they kept making it work, kept making it work, and I finally got and drove off in my car. I was like, ah, this is good. This is good. Nice. Jessica, you were doing. Um, you're doing really cool stuff now. And we, in fact, you and I, before we got on here, we're talking about um, you're working as we speak with with uh, six or seven interns, trying to get them into a process where they can learn, you know, skills that help them get 
back into the world and reentry, and and you're always looking for dollars, always looking for things. And I think one of the things I think is really important about what you do is you're helping these people, but it's so different when you've walked the walk, you've talked the talk, you've lived this world. And I think sometimes people get you know intimidated by that person that doesn't know what you've walked through, how what your experiences have been. Whereas you, you're right there with them. And and I think that I think the more we have people like you, Jessica, in that uh, arena, I think there's going to be more help given to the people who need it because they're going to reach out and realize that these people really understand what they're going through and can make something happen. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's one thing that I usually do. You know, you got to know your audience, but I usually start off with, hello, my name is Jessica. I've spent nine years total of my life incarcerated, you know, because that lived experience is key, especially somebody coming home who may, you know, have issues with authority or somebody who hasn't been where they've been. If you're coming home and you have it in your heart to want to help others, you know, that's the thing that it is, that shared lived experience that's going to help somebody, you know, maybe take the next step that they were leery to take before because of authority issues. Yeah. And I think that's what people, you know, they, they get out and they have a little bit of PTSD because it's not easy and it starts feeling like everything's stacked against me and nobody's going to give me a shot. And I really am desperately looking for that second chance reentry shot. And uh, people like you that are, that grab their hand, help them along, um, those oftentimes can make all the difference in somebody's life that gets them to the next step because that might be all they need is the next step to get in. And then they're mm-hmm. on their way. Yep. That's how I had it when I was um, incarcerated and earned my associate's degrees because somebody took the time to see value in me, you know, and I felt so worthy that I could get my education and start a new path. You know, I'm, I still had the same skills from what I used to do, but now I'm using them for good <laughs> yeah. for my education, you know. Yeah, you're using your brain and using it in the ways that you can use it to create positive effect. I know. I want to go back because I know you have such um, – it's really an incredible story because you've got three – or you've got – there's three of you as sisters. But yeah. you didn't have an easy time growing up, did you? Not at all. Um, my mom was 18, uh, and she had three daughters already. So um, we grew up on the west side of Detroit. You know, we had some good times, some real good times. Um, My parents got a divorce when I was five. Mm. And uh, I always see one of the turning points in my life was the moment my parents split up. You know, they they had my little sister playing tug of war. One had her arms, one had her legs. And my mom's like, get in the van. And my dad's like, get in the house. (laughs) You know, and I, I went in the van with my mom. Yeah. You know, and I always think what would my life have been like if I would have went in the house, yeah. you know? So that was like my first turning point did looking you, back. Did you know, because there's there's certain things that you talked about that were just normal things like the bookmobile thing coming and you guys, you know, getting books and that kind of things. But you only knew that environment that you were in. I mean, were there mm-hmm. people, were there people outside of you, Jessica, like if you went to go spend the night somewhere at some friend's house or something, did you see anything different or did you just know your little bubble and that's the way it was? Because, you know, you weren't by yourself. You did have, you know, siblings, which I guess in some cases is a blessing a lot of times because, you know, the, the siblings can always say, hey, our, our, our parents are freaked out. They're good. They've gone crazy or whatever. <laughs> but did you, did you, did you as you got into older, before you went into foster care, did you, did you know things were not like they should be? Um, I knew the abuse um, wasn't like it should be. Like we weren't allowed to wear shorts or skirts. We always had to wear long pants. And that was something we didn't talk about. We Mm -hmm. didn't take it outside of the home. You know, maybe it was a fear of being judged or a fear of being taken away from our home. But, you know, I would go to my friends. My friends knew you know, the abuse that was going on in my home, but my, their parents didn't know, you know, and now looking back, everybody knew because we acted, you know, like we were trying to cover something up, 
Yeah. You know, you always think, oh, nobody's going to find out. But I mean, it's logical. Like when you come to school in a, in the nice warm days and you have pants on, you know, and you just act a certain way, you know, it's like, you know, something's going on in your household. Yeah. But at the time I didn't see it as wrong. You know, I just knew that was my life. And I knew, you know, I had sympathy for my mom. She had, she had three three kids before she was 18. She was still a kid herself. Sure. You know, so there was that. And she also lost her own father when she was 12. So mm. it's just like the cycle that had happened. But I know that, you know, my upbringing, the way it was, made me into the person that I am today. Yeah. Even though I had to go through those hard things, I, I you know, it was, there was a purpose in it. Right. And that's kind of like your quote, everything you're doing now, mm -hmm. you love because you've experienced all these things and you really actually know what that is. When you got brought through that process of foster care, I know one of the things you told me, Jessica, is that you got split up from your sisters. And I can't imagine, mm -hmm. what was it like? You were what, 10, 12 years old when that happened? Yep. Yeah. So how that happened is, you know, I think I ran away about eight or nine was the first time I ran away. And um, we got picked up and put in juvenile delinquent centers because we were considered runaways, but we were running away from the abuse. So when they caught on, that's what we were running away from. We were placed in foster care. And uh, the whole way, so we came from Detroit all the way to Flint to the foster, the youth home facility. We were in a youth home before we were placed in foster care. But on the way there, I kept trying to memorize the path and, remembered a, a tree or a, a sign, you know, so I could make my way back home. Because even if those things were going on, that's where I wanted to be and with my family, with my mom in my home, mm -hmm. you know, where I, you know, my life, my roots were. But uh, we were in foster care for two and a half years. My two sisters, we all got split up. So we were in several different foster homes throughout those two and a half years. I myself was in three different foster homes. Um, and what was that like, when Jessica? At, what, like when you were in a foster home, were there other kids that were in the foster care? What, like, what, what were the people like? What, how did your, what was your experience like? So, um, you know, it was, it was brand new. You know, I'm not going to lie. I liked the, the life that I had. I had new clothes and, you know, I had a whole new school where I could not be a nerd. I really thought I was the coolest kid my whole life, but I know I was a nerd, <laughs> but, um, you know, it was just a whole new environment. Like the first foster home I was in, it was a couple in their 60s and they had one other foster child there. Um, we went to church. It was like in the middle of nowhere. It was literally a village. So there was like 400 people that lived there. It was so small. Which I would, had to be know, a huge change for you because you came from oh, the hood, basically. Yeah, it was so such a big change. And, you know, it was country days. I used to sit down by the ditch, you know, like they have a a ditch, it's almost like a creek, though, because it's so wide. So I used to sit there with my Walkman, listening to my 90s music, <laughs> and reading the books from the library. You know, that was, you know, I was I was by myself, and it, it felt good, but still there was that loneliness and that I want my family back, you know. And then I got moved to another foster home. Um, the first day there, they handed us a paper bag and said, pick up these pine cones. So I already knew how that one was going to be right off the bat. You know, you know, I tried to adapt to my environment, which is something I still do. Mm -hmm. I had done throughout my times in prison and, you know, not take everything negatively, mm -hmm. you know, try to make the best of the situation. Stay positive. This is only for a moment. It'll pass. You know, it's a learning lesson. You know, what you're going through now does not define you. Or where you're headed. Yeah, that's a good question. You know, so, yeah, I always tried to take, you know, something with me from those places to make me a stronger individual. When you you know, were, it made a hard me. <laughs> well, I know. I wondered, though, is, is like when you were, um, when you were able to get together, you, I think you said, was it once a month or once a week you were able to see your sisters in like a mm -hmm. kind of a strange environment? But did you guys share stories of what was going on in your lives with what was oh, happening? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So we, we met once a month. My mom, you know, for a family visit, my mom would come to Flint and me and my two sisters, we would we would all meet there for a couple hours. 
And it was just an empty room with a couch and some board games, you know, maybe a basket of stuffed animals or something. But, um, you know, it was kind of, it was just like, what's the word? Like sterile. Mm -hmm. It was sterile. Yeah. You know, that you, there wasn't love that and we didn't talk about the things we should have talked about. Like, mom, why did this happen to us? Right. You know, or mom, when it, you know, we, we, of course we said, mom, when are you getting us back? It right. took two and a half years, but you know, it's just, there was so many things left unsaid that now as an adult, I, I wish could have been talked about. Was it physical and was, was your situation physical and uh, uh, verbal or was it? Yeah. Like, yeah. Physical, psychological, verbal. Yeah. yeah. Did, and then, you know, uh, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, Jessica, did your mom make excuses about the situation where you guys were or was it just not talked about? It was just not talked about, just like the abuse. It was just not talked about. Like, even nowadays, you know, I don't bring it up a lot, but my daughter will bring it up to my mom, or my older sister is the one who really holds on to it. Yeah. And when it gets brought up, my mom denies. That never happened. I did the best I could. Right. And I know that, you know, everybody's their own person, and you don't know how she felt. You don't know what was going on with her. Right. You know, we didn't know that at the time. We were just kids, but shh. She was a young mom. It was. She was probably so stressed out. I'm not making excuses for anything. Yeah. But, you know, maybe her perspective was skewed, mm -hmm. and you know, it, it negates everybody's feelings about the situation. But things happen, and you have to move forward. Well, not let's get let's, over it, let's talk about that a little bit because you did move forward. You got out of that foster care situation after two and a half years. You went back with your mom, correct? Mm -hmm. Yep. And you would have been how old then? I was 13 when we, when we were released from foster care. So what was life like for you being put back into the community, back in with your mom, back home in that same situation? What, how, what was in your world thinking? So this was way back in 94, yeah. <laughs> 1994. Almost 30 years um, we ago. Got back. Yes. We were back with my mom and, um, she ended up having a nervous breakdown. There was an incident and um, something happened to my older sister and my little sister ran away and she went all the way to Detroit. So this is like 60 miles we're talking about. She walked, hitched buses, you know, as she was like 11 at the time and um, no, maybe 10. She was probably 10 at the time, but she made it all the way back to my dad's neighborhood. That's where she was going to find my dad. Mm -hmm. And he wasn't there, but my aunt Sharon lived on the same block and she found my aunt Sharon somehow. And then they contacted my dad who had moved to Florida. My dad came right up and he gained custody of us. He went to the court date. My mom did not. And my dad was given full custody of us. So we moved in with my dad who hadn't had us in years. And, um, what was that like? I got pregnant at the age of 15. You know, there's, there's your the whole dad. cycle. Yeah. Yeah. There's your dad. And he's hasn't really had, my mom had all the rules and structure. Yeah. You move the dad and there's no rules and right. no structure. And I'm a teenage girl in a hood. I'm going to chill, experiment, do the things. You know, I met my daughter's father at a karaoke night in the bar mm. at 14. I met him and I was pregnant a few months later and you know, I was independent after that. I moved out of my dad. I lived with him, you know, for the next five years till the cycle continued. Domestic violence in the relationship. You know, we leave each other, get back, leave it like my parents had. And, you know, it's different looking back at it now because in the moment, you know, you probably would have made some logical choices that are plain to see in your face. But that's not what happens. You know, sometimes you lead with your emotional mind and you make these impulsive decisions like, I'm going to make this relationship work, <laughs> you yeah. know? Yeah. So you get into that, you're probably like, what, 18 now? Maybe somewhere around there? Yeah, when I left, when I left um, my daughter's father, I was 20. Okay. I was 20 when I left them. And I moved back in with my dad. Okay. And that's when, you know, that life came back because growing up, my dad was always the dope man and my dad was still the dope man. He was a hustler. It was in his blood. He sold cars, he sold bikes, he sold 
whatever needed to be sold. Let's whatever it just, could sell. He was a great customer representative. We'll uh-huh. just say that. Uh-huh. <laughs> and, you know, so that's what I started doing. I started, you know, selling drugs, you know, living in the hood, doing the things except having a nine to five job. And then this is how my criminal, my criminal lifestyle started. Uh, we needed money. And when you're selling drugs, you're either having a really good day or a bad day. You know, there's really nothing accountable in that line of business. So rent was due, bills were due and I needed money quick. And the girl down the street, she said, I got somebody who can help you make some money. So I hooked up with them and ended up cashing fraudulent payroll checks. And, um, that right there, I, I opened a bank. I, we printed some blank checks to a certain company with a certain routing number and a certain amount on the check, we opened one bank account in my name, yeah. my real name. <laughs> so stupid. And then we went to 19 different banks and cashed a check at each bank. So now, eight months later, I'm arrested for uttering and publishing 19 charges by the Michigan State Trooper Fugitive Department. They came to my door at six o'clock in the morning. And um, my daughter was like five years old, four or five. And I had known that they were, you know, I knew I had charges. I knew something was coming. Um, another person that we had to cash a check with, she was had already been arrested. Okay. So I knew they were coming for me. And that morning, um, my daughter, she opened the door for the cops. And then she said, I thought y'all was the police here to, to take my mama. Oh, gosh. Because I had been preparing her. You know, I, had, I didn't want to just leave high and dry in her wonder. Yeah. So uh, I let her know that. When adults are bad, they go to the big house to get grounded, to be punished. And um, so she, I don't know how well she understood that, but she she got the gist of it. Mm-hmm. You know, she would always send me letters, draw me pictures. We'd call on the phone. She stayed with your dad? You know, she stayed with my dad, yeah. She stayed with my dad. And um, by when I got caught, I got six months in the county jail. I did, I was actually in three different jails because I cash checks in three different counties. Mm -hmm. So my first time in jail, would you like to hear about that? Yeah, I would. (laughs) It was nothing like juvie. It was nothing like juvie. Let me tell you that. It was different. Yeah. I walk into Genesee County jail. It's in Flint. So are you scared or are you, or you feel like you're the, the girl from the street that's got street cred that can walk in there? A little bit of both, but nobody knew me. So, you know, That's another one of those, let me adapt to my environment, you know, and not like a chameleon, but, you know, still me and just day by day deal with what's come my way. Right. So the day I walk in to Genesee County Jail, you know, you go in there, that smell, I will never forget that smell. I have been in there once since my incarceration on a good note, and it still smelled like that, like smashed up bologna and body sweat. That sounds horrible. It's just, oh, it's bad. And then they they cuff you to the bench and you sit there for hours and hours and hours waiting to get booked. And then, you know, you do the fingerprint. They had the ink fingerprint then. Yeah. They didn't have the digital like they got now. And um, they they make you shower, strip you down. You're wearing an orange jumpsuit. This, This jumpsuit was one piece. God forbid you didn't bring underclothes because you weren't going to get a set from them. (laughs) And then they give you a gray plastic tote and it's filled with things like a three inch toothbrush, a small tube of gritty toothpaste, Mm -hmm. a little clear deodorant that does not mask. It's gel. It's bad. It just smells so weird. It's not hiding any BO. And trust me, when you go in a place like this, and your emotions are kicking and you're scared or something, or it's hot under that nasty, scratchy wool blanket, you're going to sweat. Yeah. So if you don't have somebody taking care of you, deodorant, the good kind, is the first thing you put on your commissary, people. Uh-huh. So if you're listening Big deal. to this, <laughs> make sure you send a loved one a bottle of deodorant. Yeah, County Jail 101. <laughs> Stay clean. Yeah. Because yep. you don't want it smelling like goats in there because it's bad. It's, it's bad. Sorry for the visual guys, but you know, that's, that's that. But, uh, you know, you got your stuff, a little crusty towel that doesn't even wrap around one of my thighs. It's so small. And then 
you don't get a second jumpsuit. You have one jumpsuit that you have to wear for an entire week. So I walk in with my coat and uh, it's this huge room, huge room. It's like two stories high, but it's, you know, two story ceiling. Mm -hmm. Right in front of me is the officer's desk. In front of that is two rows of metal picnic tables. And then beyond that is rows of these big, hard plastic chairs to watch the TV that's mounted on the railing that separates the two U-shaped upper and lower cells. Um, there was probably 100 women in that one pod and two people to a cell. As soon as I walk in, though, right between the picnic tables in front of me, this lady, red, older woman, red hair and a mullet, it was a mullet. She said, where's my nutty buddy bar? B, you know, she said the cuss word. Where's my nutty buddy bar? And then smacked the daylights out of somebody. And she immediately got all the officers rushed her, cuffed her, yeah. took her away. And I'm left standing here with like two or three other new intakes. So this is me in prison. And I'm like, what's going to happen next? Yeah. Yeah. You know, and the funny thing about that is like a month later when she got out of the hole, she ended up being my bunkie, which was just. And how was, was that? Just, how was that? I mean, was she somebody that you could get along with or was she just that crazy? Yeah. So she, it, it wasn't the craziness. She, you know, didn't have anybody supporting her. So she bought what the story on that fight was. She had a pair of bifocal glasses that she borrowed to somebody and they were supposed to pay her a nutty bar for the glasses, which okay. seems so petty, but in prison, sometimes it's all you got. Yep. Good and deal. She wanted that nutty buddy bar, but she was, she was pretty cool. One of the sad things they do in institutions is if you have anger issues or if you have any mental health issues that needed to be addressed, they don't have the time and staff to give you the therapy that you need, but they got the meds. So this lady was on some meds. She would sleep all day and, a few hours through the night and she would be up and, you know, it was just sad to see somebody like that. You know, there were a couple of times she woke up from some lucid dreams looking for her lighter and her, her drug paraphernalia yeah. and like she swore she had it, you know, and I had to remind her that, Hey, we're in prison, you know, we're locked up. So, you know, it's challenging for some people in there. And that's another thing I took with me, you know, that I'm learning from and that I can use in my, re-entry work you know the sensitivity that people need because you don't know what they've been through right you don't you know what you've been through and what your perspective is right but you know we're it's such a fast-paced life we want it now we want to do this here i know my way and my way is the best way it's it's just it's a good thing to slow down and you know take into consideration what somebody's been through yeah don't don't know? just assume yeah. When you got what out, they're trying to overcome. When you got out of there, Jessica, after that six months, I, I'm assuming you went back to um, same place, your dad's place. Joy Road. Yeah. Joy Road, Evergreen. <laughs> yep. Right and back. I, and I'm assuming also that really things didn't change because I know when change happened, but it didn't happen this time. Yeah. Did not. Even though I said, I swear it, this time is going to be good. You know, I said that probably a over a dozen times in my life, but uh, went back to the same neighborhood, the same people, the same things, same behaviors. Actually, I knew I had to drop for probation, and my dad was right there with a joint ready to smoke the day I got out. Yeah. And, hey, Dad, I got to drop for probation, you know, so that, that sober time didn't last long. Um, I ended up going to jail eight a total of eight times for the same the same charge, so I got uttering and publishing and they dropped 19 charges down to six, mm -hmm. one per city. There was six cities within the three counties. So at that point, um, it was 20, 21. I had six uttering and publishing on my, and I, that's when I got my prison number. I didn't go to prison yet, but as soon as you get convicted of a felony, you get a prison number four, seven, eight, seven, five, five. <laughs> so, uh, Don't forget that. I can't. My uh, daughter doesn't forget it either. That's the sad yeah. thing. Thirty-eight two two four zero four four. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, but Jessica, there. I remember there. 
there was that that whole time period you you're going back and forth but you had a really weird thing happen where you really weren't I mean you were saying that yes I wasn't living the life that I should be living but you really didn't mm -hmm. do what I think you were at a casino is that where it was that took yeah. place so that yeah that was my last prison bit um in between the that time so like my last time in jail I got out and my dad I was out for about a year and my dad passed away. He had a severe heart attack. Oh, you got to um, tell the story. <laughs> you got to tell the story. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so um, my dad, he wasn't doing real well. He, he was obese. Um, he weighed over 500 pounds. He wasn't too active. You know, he was stuck in his ways. That's where I get it from sometimes. Stubborn. <laughs> but um, yeah, yeah, he had a um, an asthma attack and his inhaler wasn't working, you know, Nothing was working, so we called the ambulance. And um, by the time the ambulance got there, he ended up having a heart attack. And uh, we were wheeling him down off the porch, and he wasn't saying anything to me. I knew I knew something was wrong. My dad was my best friend. I was holding his hand. And I could feel his life leaving. And I was like, Dad, please just say one word. Oh, wait, yeah. I said, Dad, please just say one word to me. I promise you I'll be quiet. He said, just shut up. <laughs> Like, so that was my dad's <laughs> last words to me in His life. Last and words, I've only been on here five minutes and I've told so much of my story. I'm a talker, <laughs> but you know, so those are words to well, live by. Just shut up. That Just had life. to be a big deal in your life though, at that time, because your dad was kind of the guy that picked you up when you guys, you know, were really looking for someone to be with. And he, he was that home and that, probably the safe zone for you and your thinking. And then he dies. How are you from that point on? Like what happens with you? So um, while my dad was still alive, like right at the end, I got really heavy into drugs because I knew he was sick and I knew, you know, other things in my life, you know, I had warrants. I wasn't showing up for probation or parole. I was on parole at that time. You know, I was dropping dirty you know, it was just bad for me. And then my dad passed away and I was left with all his debt mm. and all the bills in the house. So, you know, I didn't quit using drugs, but I pulled it together so I could be a parent to my daughter. Mm -hmm. um, at that time, my daughter was 13. Um, and then my father passed away in October of 2011, February of 2012. I was arrested on my absconding warrant because I had absconded um, from probation and they sent me to prison for my first time uh, for absconding. Um, I did. So my dad never seen me go to prison mm -hmm. and my sister came and lived at my house and took care of the house for about two weeks before moving that, which meant my daughter had to move as well. So my daughter moved in with my mother, the same mother that abused us. Mm -hmm. You know, my daughter has her own story to tell, and I'll leave that at that. Yeah. Um, my, right now, my daughter's 24. She's doing so good. Um, she's got a legit driver's license. She has her own vehicle. She has an apartment. She has a three-year-old daughter. She works an, an amazing job. You know, my daughter's doing so much better than, you know, I ever was at her age. <laughs> oh, it's, <laughs> so. it's such a great story because I know, you, you know, you and I talked about this, Jessica, when somebody's a young kid or not that doesn't have to be that young of a kid that you know when when parents go to prison the, the the kids go to prison too and they they have to figure it out on the outside and like you said there were t the times well you haven't talked about when you got that final arrest but she was mm -hmm. like 15 or 16 years old and you you miss that time period of her you know developing it from a you know a girl to a woman and uh she had to mm -hmm. figure it out and you know yeah. It wasn't the best environment to figure things out, but it's so encouraging to hear that she made it, you know, she, she survived, mm -hmm. she survived it yeah. and was able to, to get out on the other side. Yeah. So that first time in prison, you know, we would talk regularly, but she was, she was, you know, with my mom, she didn't come visit. And, um, I got my GED while I was in there. So I was trying, I was trying to get it together, you know? And uh, when I got out, I enrolled in college. I got my daughter back with me and um, I just needed some money. So I started, I went back to my doctors, got my pills, started selling again, which wasn't the right move. You know, I violated probation a couple times from dropping dirty. 
my daughter was living with her friend, you know, in and out. I had to go to a rehab, which my daughter came with me. Mm -hmm. Um, And then um, October 23rd of 2014, that was the day I was arrested. But the day, a couple days before was Sweetest Day. So Sweetest Day 2014, I go to the casino with a couple guys. We all go together. We all leave together. Um, I find out three days later that there was a robbery that took place. So three days later, I am at this guy's house. I was, I had just finished selling him drugs. So I hear a knock at the door and it's open up Detroit police freaked out. That's the worst thing you want to hear. That's not a good wake up call. Right. (laughs) No, no, it was in the evening too. So I run to the back of the house to hop out the window, right? That's what, that's the life. That's your choice. Fight or flight. Right. So uh, there's, flashlights in the backyard, you know, so I hide behind the door, hurry and light that last cigarette because I know I'm getting locked up, up and away, you know, empty anything that's illegal off of me, yeah. you know, um, and the cops found me and asked me, they were looking at this picture and clearly I knew it was me. My yeah. hair was in a braid, you know, I, I just, wearing the same hoodie that I had had on at that moment. The yeah. cops were like, no, that's not her. And so I said, let me see the picture. Cause I didn't, you know, they, I knew they weren't there for drugs. Sure. That's what I knew. Yeah. And uh, they showed me the picture. I said, yeah, that's me. Like I snitched myself out. I would look at that like you idiot, <laughs> but, um, but I didn't do anything like heinous. So right. they say, all right, you're under arrest for armed robbery. I said, what? What? Not me. Yeah. So I ended up sitting in the County Wayne County Jail. At this point, I had been in five different county jails. So I'm in Wayne County Jail, and I'm waiting trial because I didn't do this. I didn't rob anybody. I didn't take anything from anybody. I didn't weaponize anybody. But I wasn't living right. I know I wasn't living right. I was in the streets. I was, you know, doing all the unhealthy things. Doing the other things, but not that thing. Right. Right. (laughs) Right. So um, fighting my case. And, um, it comes up to about seven months, 203 days. And mind you, I was on parole when this case happened. So my time is dead time. Yeah. And what dead time is, is if you get convicted of a new charge while you're on parole, while you're being held until your sentence, none of those days count. It's called dead time. So after that length of time, you know, cause it's pushed back cause of the holidays, it's pushed back cause you have a new judge. It's pushed back cause the judge is just getting in the office and she has to Mm -hmm. make all these different court days or whatever, you know? So I ended up, my daughter had been helping me, you know, I got locked up a couple weeks before my daughter's 16th birthday. So she was 15 when I got locked up that day at the house, the cops Mm -hmm. ran in. And, um, seven months later, she still, she came and seen me once a month. And, um, she's like, mom, you might as well just take a plea. So you could, your time will actually count. So I ended up taking a plea deal. They offered six years. When I went in front of the judge, she gave me five years to unarmed robbery and no habitual. So a habitual is if you if you continue to commit the same crime or even a felonious crime. Like I think California has three strikes, you're out law. You have three felonies of a certain class. You're 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 in for life. So she dropped that habitual. Um, So now I just had the unarmed robbery non-habitual five years. And I rode out to prison the very next day. So while I was in jail that time, um, I decided to get sober because I find myself back here, you know, and it's like, I said I was going to do it right so many times, Mm -hmm. you know, the, the intentions that I had were to get it together. And, you know, I don't like blaming your environment, you know, it's a product of your environment, but in this case, the people, places, and things around me was the influence to the life that I lived. Sure. So while I was in jail, um, you know, I opened my Bible for the thousandth time. <laughs> God, please help me get out of this, but I promise you I'll act right, you know, all the prayers. And uh, I opened the Bible and I found this verse, which I had already read a thousand times, but it hit different this time. And um, it said, it's Matthew thirteen forty five and 46, and it says, for he found a great pearl. And he went and sold everything he had to get that pearl. And in the Bible, they're talking about the kingdom of heaven. That Mm -hmm. pearl is the kingdom of heaven. But for me, 
that pearl was my surprise. Getting sober. And I knew I needed it. I knew that was getting in my way because in my mind, I'm always, I've always been successful. Sure. You know, I'm a Leo. My, I got the big head. I'm going to do all the good things, right? But, um, you know, I read that verse and I, I wrote it down on a little post-it note from my law pack and taped it with some shampoo tape. You know, you got to peel mm-hmm. the tape off the yeah, bottle. give you tape there, right? <laughs> that, right, yeah. So I taped it to my wall and I read it every day. I did not get sober then, but I did disconnect myself from anybody who I ever had an unhealthy relationship with. Mm-hmm. And that left me with a handful of people. Yeah. So, uh, and that's hard when you're locked up because you need money. You need those deodorants. Mm -hmm. And if you're cutting your money people off, it's a hard thing. So for me, it was really hard, but it was the only sensible thing I could do if I truly wanted to make a change. Yeah. Because at this point, this was my eighth jail stay. I've been in jail eight times at this point for all those checks. The first, the check, the original, then violating violating, violating, not payment of restitution. Yeah. Excuse me. So, you know, the day I wrote out to prison, May 15th, 2015, is the day I got sober. And I've been sober since then. It's like eight years and four months I've been sober. And uh, when I got to prison, you know, I knew that was like my life changing drastically. I had to make a change because if I'm not, I'm going to keep doing the same things and I don't want to be that person. Yeah. Almost like you got tired of that. Almost like, yeah. yeah. And I see it too in my work, you know, especially with the recovery community, excuse me, that um, they get tired and they want it in their soul and you can't push them. You can don't ever leave their side because acceptance and support, you don't have to love what they're doing, but accept them as who they are and support them through what they need. Don't give them money, right? but, you know, walk with them and support them. Say, you know, here's a place we can go or what, talk to them, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. So, um, um, well, when you got in there, not- Jessica, I know that, you know, you had been back and forth and now you're coming in with a different attitude and, and a way that you want to do things differently. Uh, did you feel different walking in that time? I mean, was it like a... Oh, God, yes. Yeah. God, yes. Because when you go in, you know, it's like all the ladies are looking at you like, oh, I knew she'd be back. <laughs> you know? Pay up. Yeah. You know, they you only a frame of noodles uh-huh. and a pack of cookies. You know, and it's like, I was ashamed. I was embarrassed. I didn't want to be there, you know? So I had a chip on my shoulder for a while. And, uh, but I was ready to make a change because I'm sober now and drugs are widely available in prison. Sure. I mean, you, it just costs a little more, Mm -hmm. but that's not the life I wanted to live. I truly saw no pleasure in it anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, even though, you know, I might've been uptight because, you know, I'm back here. Yeah. (laughs) I just had to work through that. I had to sit in that emotion and know it wasn't going to kill me, but get strengthened by it, well, you know? And, and that's a good point too, because we don't talk about this a lot, but I think it's important to talk about, like, how did you handle hard days in prison? Because, you know, there's hard days in prison, when even when you're trying to do the right thing, when you're trying to get, in your case, sober and you're getting into education, but there's hard days too. Did you have any particular way that you got yourself out of a rut? Yeah, so music. music. Music is definitely my thing. When you go in, you're allowed to purchase what's called a, a JP4 player. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you're hip on that, but it's like just a little tiny tablet. Yeah. The only thing you can do on it, though, is put music on it or write emails to family through the JP system. Mm-hmm. There's no internet access to right. it, but you have a catalog of music you can choose from. Songs cost like a dollar ninety nine to three ninety nine. you know? <laughs> and then um i, I had an mp3 player i didn't i couldn't do emails on it we, all we could do is download music but. Uh, yeah sorry i'm getting a little cough I'm trying to get rid of it's it all right you've had bronchitis yeah, so, mm-hmm. so music of course reading reading's yeah. always been my love you yeah. know i read all the game of thrones books I've read all the Harry Potter books again. You know, I yeah. fell in love with this author named Vince Flynn, you know, so that was the thing. And then for me, I'm not a writer. 
But if I was having a day that like a day that I just had to get it out and let it go, I would write and just write whatever was in my head and not even read it. I would just write it out, get it out. And, you know, right before it was time for me to leave, I pulled out those papers and read them and saw the growth within myself. You know, it was just something motivating, Mm. you know, that is cool. Mm -hmm. Jessica, when you got, how did you figure out, because you, you were able to, uh, through, was it Jackson college that you were able to get, how did you get, how did you figure all that out to be able to do that associate degree stuff inside the prison? (laughs) So I had been there about a little over a year and, um, Excuse me, this is not good here. It's all right. It's much better than the internet connection that we had. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Have you do a little so, karaoke? Um, yeah. Uh, sep- um, in, I think it was like September of 2016, a Jackson College representative came into the prison and told us about their, their program. It was a pilot program, Second Chance Pell Grant pilot program. And um, his name was Bobby, Bobby Beauchamp. That's French. And I always call him Beauchamp, but it's Beauchamp, Bobby <laughs> Beauchamp. Beauchamp. And he, <laughs> yeah. So he came in and helped us. If, if you were called, so let me go back just a second. If in prison, you have like, it's called a, a call out. So you get a paper printed of all the events you have for that day. The only way you can leave your unit is if you get it signed by a CO. You have to get signed out and signed out from the next place mm-hmm. before you come in and turn that paper in every day. Make sure you made your appointments or whatever. But um, on my call out one day, it was um, a meeting for Jackson College. And I didn't sign up for anything. So I was like, this is pretty cool. Uh, like I said at, before, my last time I went to college, but I screwed that all up. Yeah. But um. When we get there, he tells us about the curriculum. They'll be offering um, a couple different degrees, business, arts, gen studies. And uh, I was so interested. I filled out that FAFSA right there. I qualified for the FAFSA in winter of 2017. So January, I began classes. And it was just like, it, my situation turned from being in a prison to being in a live-in college situation. Yeah. Yeah, it's like your escape. So, yeah. Yeah, it was like a college facility. And at that point, you know, I had had that chip on my shoulder. And I realized, you know, I worked a lot because I was in my head. So I worked a lot out within myself. Mm-hmm. I kind of went back down to that root, you know, that root that we bury. We all have that that cause, that reason why we do all these other things in our lives. And for mm-hmm. me, I had buried that root with sex, drugs, unhealthy relationships. And just that lifestyle, you know, we put on that mask and we walk out and everybody's like, oh, yeah, she's good, Mm -hmm. you know, but you got that root buried in there. So I was able to pay attention to it, you know, pull out all those other things that I did, which ended up being so much more shameful and embarrassing than that original thing that now seems so petty. Mm -hmm. So I had created a prison for myself in my head my whole life. You know, I had been locked up in this prison and it just got worse, especially being in a physical prison. But while I was in that physical prison, I was able to break out and free myself mentally, you mm-hmm. know, and, and my education had a lot to do with that. Being sober, I had that void left in me and I filled it with school and I was able to start learning who I was and find my identity through knowledge and not just the curriculum knowledge, but with all the other women who were in the courses with me, we learned together Mm -hmm. because it was like our untold experiences, you know, came out through, you know, our cohort. Sure. Well, I'm sure it gave you confidence. It started, that that does a lot of different things for you. And and it's a deep thing that you just said that you were, you were locked up in prison, but you freed yourself out of the prison of your own mind because, Mm -hmm. Uh, and you know, a lot of that, like you said, Jessica is also timing. You were ready for that and you, Mm -hmm. and you got really good grades too. You, I mean, you graduated with high honors. Um, but I, you talked about too, the idea that this proud moment came about, you had your daughter, you, you, this was a real time for you kind of to show up, show out, uh, show off 
that you had done this thing. And I, if I remember right, people were able to come see you graduate. Is that correct? Yep. Yep. So this was the pilot program. Like I had said, they've done it. So in Michigan, there's 31 prisons. Only one of those 31 is for women. And it's supposed to house 1,800, but it houses 2,200. So it's definitely overcrowded. Yeah. So there's a lot of strict rules about the things that they can do. They were leery about even letting the college program come in, but they did. And in August of 2019, I, along with 16 others, there were 17 in our graduating class. We all graduated with high, high honors, Phi Theta Kappa. And we had our graduation. So there's the auditorium in the prison. Mm -hmm. um, there's three sections. One of the sections was for us as graduates, you know, and after everybody was seated, they did, did the ceremony and walked us in. And yeah. so then the middle section was for anybody who was in the prison and was attending school or helped out in Jackson College. You know, they could be there for their GED or whatever. Mm -hmm. They were allowed to come. And then in the other section on the other side of the room, our family members were allowed to come. And we were allowed to invite two immediate family members. And my daughter was the one. I didn't invite anybody else but her. And uh, when they called my name and I got up and I walked across that stage, I shook all the faculty's hands. And the last person on that stage that I shook his hand was the warden, wow. Warden Stephen Brewer. And uh, when I shook his hand, I just felt that, you know, I got my dignity, my worth back. Yeah. And then right after that, I ran to the end of the stage and it was they let us take a picture. So there was a professional photographer there for Jackson College. And I, my daughter ran up and. She said, I'm so effing proud of you. So loud. Everybody heard. And they <laughs> roared. And the moment we got our picture. And then afterwards, they had set a little room aside. And they had, like, some Kool-Aid and some cakes. Yeah. You know, but we got to be with our family. That is so cool, though. So cool. Oh, it was so awesome. It was so awesome. How far were so you awesome. from the door of getting out when that all happened? Uh, so, August. 2019, I still had, uh, let's see, five, nine months. I was okay. getting out May, May of 2015. I mean, 2020. Yeah. So that graduation happened, and then COVID happened right after. I can't imagine, was, Jessica. I, you know, because prison's horrible. But I've, oh I've talked to some people who were in prison when COVID happened, and I, I, what was your experience like with that? Oh my goodness. I have a whole journal. Like I just told you, I don't journal, but when I, okay. So in April I start losing my smell and my taste, you yeah. know, and then my, my nose was like, so I'm I told one of the officers, this is the beginning of this is April 2nd. Yeah. And she said, okay, go to medical. I go to medical. They take my temperature and they take my uh, blood pressure yeah. and they say, Oh, you're okay. Go back to your unit. Okay. Right. Yep. I'm leaving. My outdate is May. 10th. May 10th was my out day. And I go back to the unit. And then when you're in a certain unit, you're about to go home. Within 30 days of you going home, they move you to the, the go home unit, mm -hmm. what it's called, whatever. So I get packed and go over there. And I'm there for a couple days. And then I have to take my COVID test before I go home. So I go to healthcare and I did the COVID test. It comes back positive. Mm -hmm. So guess who gets moved to the hazmat unit? So they took a whole unit, sectioned it off, and the officers wore hazmat suits. And I got put in a room with another girl. We were quarantining for 14 days at that time. I am just coming into her room. She had already been in there for 10 days, yeah. almost done with her quarantine. But they had to pack me in there, and her quarantine started all over again. Oh, my gosh. It was ridiculous. And I ended up not being able to go home on my out date because of the COVID. I went home 18 days later. They kept me 18 days. That's a, I mean, that had to feel like a lifetime when you know you're getting oh. out and then it's 18 days later. Oh, so terrible. I had so five terrible. days. I had five days later because mine happened to fall into that Thanksgiving time. And so they, nobody oh, was yeah. working on Wednesday. Nobody was working on Friday. So I, I think I got oh. released on that Monday. So just, and then they shut off all your communication when they think right. you're going home. So I couldn't communicate with anybody. It's just, it was like yeah. that. Those five days seemed like five years. Right. And you know, they should, it should be a law not to have to hold you long. <laughs> it's the truth, isn't it? 
It's awful. It's ridiculous. So let's talk about you finally get out. You know, you finally. Yeah. What? Who's on the other side of that world for you? So um, I have to back it up again. I know I keep doing that. But uh, while I was in, this girl came in, Danielle, and she, you know, was like, hey, I got this program you should come to. You know, when you get out, you should come to this program. I'm like, girl, I'm going home. I'm not going to no program. I've been in jail long enough. I'm not doing it. So um, she asked me about a dozen times. I turned her down about a dozen times. And so the last time she said, okay, how about I just get you a mentor from this program? And I'm like, okay. You know, when you get a mentor, you get a visit. When you get a visit, you get a cheeseburger and a pop. <laughs> exactly. So I'm down for that. So um, I get this mentor, and she's the retired probate judge for Jackson County. And I thought she was going to come in like high court, me criminal, but we were equals. We were chatty hens. She shared her life. I shared mine. And she was the one who came and picked me up from prison that day in a rainstorm. You know, I ordered my clothes. And then by the time I got my clothes, you know, go home clothes, they were too small. So like my belly was popped out. My pants were tight. <laughs> the black nail shoes. It was just bad. <laughs> and we immediately stopped at McDonald's. So I could change my clothes. She brought me clothes. Oh, that was nice. And um, I chose to go to the program because I had realized, you know, I had support there from people I didn't even know. And also, if I kept going back to Detroit, to the same address, the same places, people and things, yeah. I would have turned back into that same sure. mindset and behaviors. So I went to this program in Jackson. I didn't even know there was a Jackson in Michigan. I thought it was in Mississippi, but... There's a Jackson. There's about 30,000 people in Jackson. Yeah. And uh, I went to this program it's called SOAR. It stands for She Overcomes and Rises. And it's not a recovery home or a transitional home. It doesn't have any signage on the wall. It's a real home, and it's a, it's a mansion. There's enough for 12 women to stay there. And I got to stay there by myself almost for like the first seven months. I was the first female in the program. Wow. Danielle was supposed to do it, but she had went on and moved with her son. So I was doing this program alone until they got more women. But that program allowed me to just sit and be in the real world and heal. You know, be outside. Take a little time, right. Yes. Yeah, so when I got out, I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm going to do all the things. But then your shoulders are so heavy because that's an overwhelming fear and tension and life piling on you. But when you were inside, you said, oh, I'm going to do this, this, this. Yeah. And then... Sometimes when you get out, it most of those things are impossible. Like you can't get housing, you can't find a job. You know, maybe you can get some education. You know, you you have to go see this caseworker, that caseworker, this therapist, your parole officer. Yeah. Make all these meetings. How I don't even have transportation. You right. know, they just assume all. You're that. lucky if your family is still there for you to support you. Yeah. So then thinking about all those things, even now I'm feeling overwhelmed, but I bypassed that that stage in my life. But it's just. It's a so lot. overwhelming. It's a lot. Yeah. And that's why the support, you know, is such a big deal because if somebody does have support from their family, you know, it's, it's, it pushes somebody light years ahead. But if somebody doesn't have support from their family, I mean, my gosh, it's a lot. It's just a yeah. lot. Yeah. And my daughter, the whole time I was in there, I used to spend about $70 a month on phone calls. And me and my daughter, so like I said, she, I got locked up right before she turned 16. And right before I came home, I found out she was pregnant. Wow. So I found out like March of 2020 that she was pregnant. And by then I had already decided to go to Jackson mm -hmm. and she was in Detroit. So she, I talked to her about it and she said, out of the mouths of babes, I'm telling you, she said, mom, how could you love your, how could you ever help my, help me if you don't learn to help yourself and love yourself? Mm. So that hit me like a ton of bricks, like this, this kid, all wise. Mm -hmm. She was, she was 21 at that point, but still, yeah. what were you doing at 21? <laughs> <laughs> That's a wise statement. <laughs> you know, so she, um, she just blessed me, you know, and, and, and walked with me and kept her patience with me. You know, she still makes those threats. Mom, if you ever go back that way, I swear. <laughs> you know? well, but she knows. She sees in me. So. Jessica, let's talk about how you got into what you're doing now. Because, you know, I know, it, I know it fills you up. But I think it's kind of a funny story how <laughs> you actually had this all happen. <laughs> yeah, this is pretty funny because uh, people still talk about this, still, within our organization. So um, I was working for a program 
Um, it's called, it was called Step Success to Every Parole, and what they do is they mentor returning citizens, you know, as best they could, you know, with low funding in the community. Mm-hmm. So um, I had a mentor, a mentee. I took him to get his record expunged at Michigan Works here. Um, Nation Outside was having an expungement fair, and this is the first I had heard about Nation Outside, and this was actually um, like April of 21. Mm-hmm. No, April of 22. 22. Yeah, this yeah. Was just last year. yeah, April of 22. So lo and behold, guess who's there? Tony Gant, Nation Outside Policy Operations. So um, I take my mentee in. He does his expungement. I ended up just for the heck of it doing, trying to do my expungement. I talked to Tony for a bit, you know, and then I left. Tony left me on a thumbs up in our last conversation. Mm-hmm. This was our old school. He won't do that no more. But uh, I get a call back about two weeks later from a woman. And she's like, hi, um, we're sorry to tell you we can't help you with your expungement. Um, that was just went off. I started cussing. I'm like, oh, <laughs> no, no. I need this expungement. I can't find housing. Yeah. I can't get my life together. I got a good credit score. I actually have a bank account. You uh-huh. know, I'm doing real good. I need this. And she's like, wow, ma'am, I'm so sorry. We, we can't help you, but you do sound like you'd be a great advocate for Nation Outside. <laughs> have you met Tony yet? And I'm like, yeah, Tony left me on the thumbs up. Uh-huh. She's like, oh, well, I'll have him call you back. So, you know, she might have said a few other things, but we'll leave that within the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, I actually ended up talking with Tony and whatnot. Then I, I met up with her. She called me a little while later, a few days, and said, you know what? I never make those phone calls. I just happened to be making that phone call that day. And lo and behold, she's the executive director of Nation Outside. So funny. So And she recommended I you. I the boss that got hired. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely got hired. I mean, it's one of the best the stories. You, you, you cussed out the boss and she thought you'd make a great advocate <laughs> yep. for Nation Outside. So then I, um, I volunteered for like a couple events. And then they hired me as an engagement specialist. And then Tony trained me on everything I knew. He introduced me to people in the community. He introduced me to partnering agencies like for housing and education and resources. Um, He introduced me to the mayor. He introduced me to like the city commissioner, all these people, you know, the chamber of commerce and like who I've built relationships with since. So he was just educating me through this process. And, you know, like I said, education is my thing now, right? It is. And housing. Yeah. Yep. So Tony, um, Tony was like, all right, I'm going to let you do this event by yourself. And he just dropped me in with no life jacket. I might have had a life jacket. It was probably about halfway full, but <laughs> he helped me, you know. And, I mean, I did great. And Tony was real proud of me. And then I started running Jackson on my own, and they, they hired me full time. So I was an engagement specialist, and now I am the manager of engagement for the entire state. So what Nation Outside is, is – um. I'll tell you our mission statement. We are a grassroots organization led by fully formally incarcerated individuals. Our staff has a total of 500 plus lived years experience. That means they've been incarcerated a total, all of us. Mm -hmm. And uh, our mission is to drive policy and practice reforms that build transformative systems of support for justice impacted people. And basically what we, what that means is that we're on the, the back end of things, addressing the barriers to reentry. So when people come home from prison, they can acclimate into society better. So we work on things like voting rights. In the state of Michigan, even with a criminal history, you can vote. The only way you cannot vote is if you're currently serving a sentence. So if you're in jail awaiting sentencing, you can vote. And we do something called jail-based voting. We go in, we help the people inside get registered, get absentee ballots. Sometimes the candidates will come in so the people know who they're voting for. Mm -hmm. So they can actually get a chance to use their voice, Wow, which is important. We also do ban the box on employment Mm -hmm. and college applications. And um, our main thing we're doing right now is called Fair Chance Housing. And what Fair Chance Housing does is it prohibits landlords from discriminating against people due to their criminal history. And we all know housing is one of our basic needs. Yep. So we are fighting Tooth and nail. We've been working on it for two years. We got a, a hearing, a committee hearing coming up. Our bill, House Bill 4878, was dropped 
um, introduced on June 29th by Representative Abraham Ayash with 20 co-sponsors. That's awesome. So we're moving forward. We're, we're gaining support on that. We have sign-on letters. If anybody's interested in checking this out, we're at nationoutside.org. And uh, you can become a member. You can do Support some call it. to action. We have different things you can participate in in your community. Um, there's events. There's an events page, chapter meetings. We have monthly chapter meetings where we get together and talk about our initiatives and what's going on in the community and how can we address that together. And then we have events all throughout the month. We have 10 regions. So we're in Grand Rapids, Traverse City, Kalamazoo, Flint, Detroit, Lansing, Jackson, Washtenaw County, and Oakland County. And our other group is a women's chapter. So it's statewide. Yeah. If you haven't spent one night in jail um, and you're a female, this is the chapter for you because the first hour we talk about initiatives and community, community needs. And then the last hour of that meeting, it's solely for the women who have been incarcerated. So they can have a chance to chat with each other and talk to each other about what they're going through and maybe find some supportive sisters within that meeting that they can, you know, have conversations with or get resources from, you know, particular ones. Jessica, I love that. I mean, all that stuff, and that has to fill you up, all those things that you're doing, because you know that you're having a direct impact on people. You know how important that is because you've gone through it yourself. And those initiatives, you know, those type of things. I think uh, I've talked to quite a few people from Michigan. I think Michigan's very well organized. You know, I, I'd like to see more of that in other states that's going on because I feel like Michigan's got a really great leadership group that's uh, really taken, you know, a lot of responsibility, just taking it by the horns and, and gone at it. And couldn't be more proud of you, Jessica, on what you've been able to do because you've just, you just, it's not easy to, just take a, a left turn when you've been on the right path or over here on this path and you decided to take this path and you did, and mm -hmm. you had to really give everything up to get what you wanted. And it's, yeah. uh, it's impressive. It's impressive. Okay. I, oh yeah. I also, um, so for my bachelor's in social work, I had to do my internship. I interned with the mayor and the mayor of Jackson is the first black mayor in the city. And his name is Daniel Mahoney. He's such a great guy because he comes from here. Yeah. So he knows what the community, you know, has issues with and he sure. can address them. Of course, he worked from the bottom to yeah. get where he's at. So he was my, uh, he, he extended that internship to me directly. And the city manager, Jonathan Green, was my intern supervisor. And wow, was that such an I can't experience. imagine. Yeah. I mean, you're working right there with the mayor. Some days I would sit there, like they know me well, and they know I have a criminal history. They know where yeah. I come from. They know me. But even besides that, you get in your head, and I'm sitting there some days thinking, when are they going to find out I don't belong here? You know what <laughs> I mean? Imposter syndrome. Well, you know, right. uh, Jermaine Wilson, who was a, was a guest on this show, and he's been on a lot of different shows, but he actually served time at Leavenworth, and he is the mayor of Leavenworth now. So it's just one of those, you know, there's great stories all around. And that's one of the reasons I love this show of doing this show is because there's a lot of bad stories, but the good stories are really good stories. It's like Jessica, your story, you know, Jermaine's story. Th those are stories that you hear those and you think, okay, it is possible. If I, I know it's not easy. Yeah. It's not going to be easy, but I can do it mm -hmm. because Jessica did it or Jermaine did it. And uh, I think it's inspiring. I, I want to ask you, though, because, you know, I ask everybody this at the, the interview is because you've had such a, uh, quite a, it's just been a wild ride for you and you've lived quite the life. What do you think one of your biggest takeaways from where you've been to where you are now? Um, like I live just by realism. So if you can't be yourself, you're going to get yourself into trouble. The truth is going to come out someday. You know, all the things that we push down inside of us, like that root that I said, and we just bury it, bury it. Yeah. It's going to come out eventually. So to, to be your best self, you literally have to do some internal cleaning and start right there with your core before you can ever love yourself as a person wholly. 
and then love your family and then love your community and then be a part of changing the world. Wow. You know, I love that. It's Jessica. just that. <laughs> That's good My stuff. Process. <laughs> That's good stuff. I mean, that is really good. I, uh, if if people want to get a hold of you, how do they get a hold of you, Jessica? Um, nationoutside.org. Okay. And um, our whole team is on there. If anybody's interested in contacting us with any questions about our initiatives, our policy change, or even just becoming a volunteer or something you guys can do to support us, nationoutside.org. My okay. picture's on the About Us page. So <laughs> I, you love, I know, I really saw it. Pictures. <laughs> and um, <laughs> let's see. And, and it, on, on my side, it, I know for you guys out there listening, you get something out of this, and Jessica's story is great. Please go leave a review on Apple or Spotify. Follow the show. It's really easy. You just hit the bell on Spotify, drop down, hit follow on, on Apple. Um, Leave a review if you got time. It puts the show on steroids. I'm not sure why. I don't understand the algorithm. But mm -hmm. whenever you guys do that, it really just pumps up the volume. Um, if you want to get a hold of me, BrentCassie.com. It's with a T Y, not a D Y. I, I wish when growing up I was Sean and David, but I am not. T Y BrentCassie.com. Um, if you're looking for a book out there, I wrote one. Uh, Nightmare Success. You can find it on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, and. Uh, as I used to say, uh, when I was writing my emails back and forth from prison, stay strong. I'll do this the same. And Jessica Henry, thank you so much. Such a great story. I hope you share this story all the time. Thank you. I'm going to, I'm writing a book too. That'd be a good book. That's, I want to read that one. Yes. And then probably a movie. I wonder who would play me. I'd love to see that too. <laughs> Margot Robbie. She can play go. me. Margot Robbie's going to be playing Jessica Henry. Here we come. <laughs> Here we come. All right. Nightmare success in and out. Thanks, everybody.